Have you ever tried to learn a new language? You know how hard and frustrating it can be translating every single word when you first start. But after a while, something happens. Suddenly you start not only to speak, but to think and feel in that language. You eventually start interpreting life through it. That's fluency. In many ways, the gospel is like a new language. It takes time. We can be slow to learn, fast to forget, and unwilling to trust. But when the truths of God through Jesus become part of us, we start interpreting the whole world around us through the lens of God's perspective. And slowly, every aspect of our story starts to be affected by the redemption story. Relationships, work, and even ourselves, everything starts to have a new meaning. Even more, we are able to transmit the truth of the gospel in ways that speak to the real and present brokenness and longings of people. And so, just like when you become fluent in a new language, you discover a new way to see the world, with the gospel, you discover that Jesus is good news for everything. Well, welcome to class, everyone. This is Gospel Fluency 101, The Basics. So for those of you that hated school and you just went, <gasps> I'm not ready for this, not ready for class, don't worry, we don't have any tests today. Um, but for the next three weeks, we're gonna be in this series of Gospel Fluency. It's based on a book with the same name. It's written by a guy named Jeff Vanderstel. It's a great resource. I'd encourage you to pick it up. Now, for me, I love school. I loved it so much so that when I got to college, I think I have enough credit hours for like two or three different majors. But n like nothing actually went together. Um, so eventually they just gave me a diploma that says multidisciplinary studies, which means I have a degree in general knowledge. So most interviews kind of go, you know, why should we hire you? Because I know things. Like I just have a basic understanding of the world. As far as languages go, um, the, this was not my strong suit. Uh, my mom started teaching us French when I was like five or six. We would do this at the breakfast table. Um, applaud her for that. Uh, all I remember is uh, the numbers one through 10, and I can say there are many trees and flowers in the forest. <laughs> it's not getting me very far. In high school, I took Latin. Anybody else? Got any Latin people? What I remember from Latin, I can say the word Latin. That's all I got. In college, I did uh, Spanish 101. Not once. Not twice, three times. I didn't fail it two times. I just kept signing up for this class. I'm not really sure why I did that, but it's on there. Um, when it came to English, however, this was like, this was my subject. I love English. Um, I can do it all day long. This is my new favorite slogan. I'll give you a second to, if you don't get this, you find somebody that's laughing and they'll explain it to you later. Um, but as far as the gospel was concerned, I sort of felt like, uh, you know, I, I can test out of this class, right? Like, I, I got that one down. Um, so I'm learning lately, though, that that's not the case. My gospel fluency is sort of deficient. So if you're thinking to yourself like I did, hey, I got this. Wake me up when the bell rings. Let me say this. Don't take a nap. Take notes. Um, here's the thing. Today, we're going to go hard and fast. This is like the review class where we're all getting on the same page because for the next three weeks, we want to have a firm grasp on where we currently stand uh, so that we can begin to speak this language of the gospel fluently. So I want to set the stage here a little bit. Why are we in this gospel fluency class together? It's because we all have a problem, and the problem is we're all unbelievers. We all have areas in our life where we don't believe in the full power and the working of Jesus to take care of our past, our present, and our future. Now, for some of you, like you heard that, we're all unbelievers, and there's a little, you take a little offense to that, right? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've been following Jesus 25 years. Don't call me an unbeliever. That's, the, that's how I felt the first time I read that in the book of, you're an unbeliever. I was like, nope, I got this one down. Don't call me that. It's not so much that we're saying we don't believe in Jesus. It's just that there are these areas in our life where we slip into and out of belief. We start with this faith in Jesus and then we end up slipping into a faith in ourselves or some other thing. This is an example from this last week. Maybe you can relate to this. I was driving down I-35 and I began to have all of these thoughts of, I got a lot of stuff to do. We're having a baby in like a week. How much do those cost again? Um, do we have money for this next child? Um, 
Do we have a car seat for this next child? No, we have not even bought a car seat yet. Okay, there's that. I have like 15 projects before this child comes that I need to accomplish, and I'm starting to feel really anxious inside. I'm starting to get a little worried that my life is kind of spinning out of control, and I had that feeling of, I'd, I'd just sort of be okay if I disappeared right now. You know that feeling? And I just had to gospel myself in that moment. That's the language that we use. I have to speak the gospel to myself that, you know what, God is great. I don't have to be in control. Scripture says that when he speaks, entire worlds are created. It tells us that he knows the number of hairs on our head, so he knows us so intimately. He knows all about us. And it says that he's working all things together for good and for his glory. And so I just took this deep breath, and it was just like, Okay, I'm okay, because God is great, and I don't have to be in control. You see what I'm saying? We start with this faith in Jesus, and then we end up putting a hope in ourselves. So we have these areas where we slip into and out of belief in the gospel. What's the answer to it? Gospel fluency. It's the answer. We have to learn to speak the language of the gospel, because the language of the gospel will speak into every situation in our life. And this is the truth that we believe. It's the big idea for the series. Gospel fluency moves us from unbelief to belief in Jesus. Capture that belief in Jesus in every area of our life. And this is what we're gonna work out together. So just wanna sort of pause here. This is a review class. We all need to get on the same page. Let's talk about our current definition of the gospel. If you're like me, if you grew up in a faith tradition, I would say you have a very narrow view of the gospel probably. It's a very zoomed in sort of lens. And it's not that it's a bad definition, it's not that it's incorrect, it just might be incomplete. And that definition probably goes something like mine did of the gospel is Jesus died for your sins and you can spend eternity in heaven with him. Right, like that's good news. Don't hear me saying that's not good news. I wanna celebrate that news. But we need to unpack the fullness of what that phrase means because there's so much in it and that's what we're gonna begin to do today is just talk about the whole picture. If our only definition of the gospel is that that's like deciding to learn a language and deciding that you're gonna just learn hello and think that that's like enough to get you by in the country that you speaks that language, right? Like you learn hello, I got this word down. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to this country that speaks this language. You get there, sit down at the restaurant, waiter comes by, what would you like to eat? Hello. I, had that, I felt like that joke would go over. I worked real hard on it. It hasn't hit at all today. Or like you're on the, you're on like the street dancing around because you gotta go to the bathroom. You're just grabbing strangers. Hello, hello. And they're thinking, what's wrong with this person? Like you don't have enough language to make it by in that place. And so if our language is too zoomed in, if we only know a part of it, it's not enough. So when our neighbors come by and they're saying, hey, I, I just had this terrible fight last night and I think our marriage is gonna end. And we're like, Jesus died for your sins. You can spend eternity in heaven. I'm being a little cynical with that. It's, it's not that it's not good news, but it doesn't speak into the fullness of the situation that they're feeling, the pain that they have, and the gospel actually does that. It does speak into every situation of our life if we'll learn how to unpack the fullness of what it means to be fluent in the gospel. And I wanna say this, it's not that the gospel's not good news, like when we say that phrase, but it's not locked up into a one-time event and a future hope. And that's what we're doing when we narrow it down just to that phrase. We're locking it up into a one-time event and a future hope. But the gospel, as believers, we don't just look to Jesus as, as this thing for going to heaven when we die, but we look to Jesus to speak into every situation in our life. Jesus and the gospel, they become the filter through which we feel, perceive, and think. And every language has a dominant cultural story that it exists within, right? Like when you think about a language, it fits within a cultural story and that culture informs what the words that you speak mean and then the language in turn can create culture. So I wanna camp out there for a little bit. Let's talk about the cultural story that we have as believers. So the dominant cultural story that the gospel fits in is the story of God. It's the story of God in all of history. We just spent a year going through this, right? From Genesis to Revelation, there is this big grand narrative of God and all the little stories in that, in that big story, they point to who? They point to Jesus. Jesus is at the center of the story and so when we're speaking the language of the gospel, if we're not speaking about Jesus, we are missing the point. 
And so we're gonna talk about Jesus today and how he is at the center of this gospel story. And in the, in the Jesus story, everyone finds completion, everyone can find transformation, and everyone can find belonging. This is the good news we wanna wrap our hearts around. So we're gonna do a quick run through. This is the review part. We're running through the whole story. The, the cultural story that we live in has four parts. The first is this. The first part of the story is creation. In the beginning, God created all things. And in the garden, he made humanity. And he made us as these co-creators and, and he put the divine imprint on us. And this creation was out of the overflow of the generosity of God. It was out of the overflow of the love of God. It was out of the overflow of the community of God. And it was this beautiful, holistic picture. And the Hebrew language has this word, shalom, to describe what was happening there in the garden. Now, when we hear shalom, we often think of the word peace. And it's absolutely that, but that's not, again, the whole story. It's more than just laying down arms. It's more than just not fighting. Shalom carries with it this idea of universal flourishing. It's a, whole, a wholeness between God and people and between each other, between people and people and in ourselves. In the garden, in that beginning of the story, there was a wholeness that Adam and Eve felt in themselves. But then, three chapters in, it all falls apart. So we call the next part the fall. In this part of the story, unbelief enters. The enemy begins to put questions into the story that they hadn't had before. And, and so those first people begin to ask, maybe, maybe God doesn't love us completely. Maybe he hasn't shared with us everything. Maybe there's more to this than what he's giving us. And suddenly this breaking happens and there's no longer shalom between God and people. And suddenly there's this bro brokenness that happens between people. It says Adam and Eve knew they were naked and, and that they felt shame. And so now there's this brokenness between them and they felt shame. So there's a brokenness inside of themselves. The shalom that was the picture of the, of the wholeness, the universal flourishing has now disappeared. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. The next part of the story is redemption. As the story continues, God begins this plan of redemption immediately. He enters into the story and he is working to make this relationship right again, to make our relationship with each other right again, and to make the fullness of ourselves come back. And so he calls a people unto himself. He calls out the nation of Israel. He says to Abraham, I will bless you and you will be a blessing and all nations will be blessed through you. What's he saying to Abraham? I am gonna do this work where I am drawing people back to myself. I will do the work to make this relationship right again. Well, the people of Israel are actually pretty terrible at this. Um, we shouldn't give them a hard time because we wouldn't have been any better. Uh, but they point to a coming Messiah. There is this constant prophecy that one is coming, one is coming. One day one will come and all things will be made whole again. And so Jesus enters into the story. And despite being tempted in every way, he, he fulfills this covenant promise and he gives his life. He gives through the death and the resurrection, he makes this relationship right again. That's what we proclaim. We talk about that. What does Jesus proclaim while he's walking the earth? The good news of the kingdom of God. What's the good news in his life? We see it through his life, through his miracles. Jesus is giving sight to the blind. So he's making things right again that are broken. Jesus is becoming a friend to lonely people. So he's painting a better picture where there's brokenness between people. He says, let's wipe that out. Jesus feeds people that are hungry because in the kingdom, there's no more hunger. There is no more brokenness. Jesus is saying, let me show you what the kingdom looks like and it's good news and he proclaims it and then he gives his life to give us more good news because here it is. It's not by grace, but it's by works. That old covenant, there was this constant working out of their Salvation to prove to God, we're coming back, we're making these sacrifices, we're doing this thing, but Jesus says, it's no more earning. You don't earn it. It's actually always been by grace, and now I'm showing it by laying down my life. Jesus is at the center of the story. Now, we've talked about some vocabulary words already, right? When you learn a language, you learn some vocabulary. So we got creation, we got fall, we got redemption. Let's talk about salvation. This is a word that we as believers use a lot. Romans 1.16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. Well, at some point in your journey, you might have said something like I do. I was saved at nine years old. At some point in your journey, some might, they might ask you, what were you saved from? We need to be able to tell them that. We need to be able to explain what salvation is. Salvation is not a one-time event. 
This is what the gospel tells us. If the gospel is not locked up into a one-time event, then neither is salvation. Let's talk about this real quick. Through his life and his resurrection, his death, his resurrection, Jesus saves us, has saved, past tense, from the penalty of sin. So this is good news. You have been saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus gave his life for you. He became the sacrificial lamb, entered into this story of ours, put on flesh, moved into the neighborhood and said, I am going to step into the story and take care of the sin problem that you have by living this life and by giving my life for you. So Jesus has saved us, past tense, but the story is not locked up into a one-time thing. And so we have this present tense. We are being saved from the power of sin. This is good news. In Romans 8, we're told that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is living in us. So when we are facing sin, we know that the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead can help us overcome sin. Jesus says after his death and resurrection, he is sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, to live in us, to help us overcome sin. So we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin and this future news that we will be saved from the presence of sin one day. This is back to that future hope that we talked about. This is 1 John 3, 2 says this. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. What's this telling us? That one day, this brokenness that we have between God and us will be made whole completely. We won't ever feel like it's disconnected. The brokenness that happens between us and this disconnect that we often have with people in our lives, that will be taken care of. And the brokenness that's in ourselves We will be made whole again. And it brings us to this final part of the story, that future hope of restoration. We believe in the second coming, that Jesus is coming again when all of evil will be dealt with. Decisively, heaven and earth, it says they'll collide, they'll commingle, and all the old things will be made new. And that shalom will return again to the earth because of Jesus who is at the center of the story. But let me say this, it's not locked up just in that future hope. Jesus is asking us, he is inviting us to enter into the story and paint pictures of the kingdom now to show what that fullness of shalom looks like in our life. So when our neighbors are facing a tough situation, we're there to walk with them and say, there's good news. When our coworkers are feeling this, the stress of a job, we can say, hey, we don't have to be in control because God is great. He's in control. We can begin to paint pictures of the kingdom. When we see lonely people, we can do what Jesus did and befriend them. When we see hungry people, we can give them food. We can visit people in prison. We can racial reconciliation. You name it, everything. We can be pictures of the kingdom entering into the world and bringing shalom here and now by living out the gospel message, but we have to learn how to speak it. So we've got our dominant cultural story. It's the story that we know of of all of of God and all of history. We've got this vocabulary that we can speak. Now I wanna talk about some cultural expressions, all right? So when you learn a language, you do like the really formal class, right, where you have to learn where the commas and the periods go and it's very formal. But then you learn how to kinda speak the language on the street, right? The language that helps you get by when you're just interacting every day with people. And so... We call these the four G's of the gospel. So you got these flashcards as you came in, right? That's how we learn a language, pull out your flashcards, start working through your flashcards. I just wanna tell you how this has become so practical in my life. This is how we begin to speak the gospel to ourselves. The first one is this, God is great, so we don't have to be in control. God is great, this is good news, so we don't have to be in control. Psalm 115.3 says this, our God is in the heavens. He does as he pleases. Anybody else wish that verse was about them? It's about him. It's about what he can do. Again, this passage, he knows the hairs on your head. We don't even have this information. Psalm, or Matthew 19.26, with God, all things are possible. Isaiah 46.10, he declares the end from the beginning. Our culture tells us what? Be in control of your finances. Be in control of your future. Be in control. Be in control. Be in control. What happens when we're not in control? We get anxious. We get fearful. We begin to try to control, and then we can't, and so we get more anxious and more fearful, and this grows in us. But here is good news that we can proclaim. When that unbelief enters in, God is great, 
so we don't have to be in control. We can surrender and trust him and say, just like Jesus did in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. I trust in you. Here's the second one. God is glorious, so we don't have to fear others. Now, glorious is not a word that we typically walk around using on a you know, day-to-day basis. So this word carries with it this idea that, that God has more importance and more value in speaking into your life than anything else. Exodus, 1, 15, or Exodus 15, 11 says this, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Why does this one matter? Well, if God carries more importance in your life, then you don't have to spend time worrying about whether you have the approval of others. We spend so much time worrying about what other people think of us when God has already called us son and daughter and beloved and says you have the approval of the one who created you. Why are you spending so much time worrying about what someone else thinks? Here is the good news. When that anxiousness rises up in you and you're fearing the brokenness or fearing rejection, speak the gospel to yourself. God is glorious and he gives you approval. You don't have to fear others. The third one, God is good, so we don't have to look elsewhere. Elsewhere for what? Elsewhere for satisfaction. Do we spend our lives doing this, looking for the things that will make us happy, looking for the things that we think will bring us contentment? In the garden, what what broke in the unbelief is that God would not fully satisfy them. And so we begin looking at entertainment. We begin looking for power. We begin looking for recognition. We're willing to throw away a relationship for a one night relationship because we think it will satisfy when it won't. We're willing to throw away a, career, or a family for pursuing a career because we think the career is going to bring us contentment and satisfaction. Right? These are areas of unbelief that when we look for satisfaction and contentment anywhere else other than God, we're not going to find it. It's going to let us down. God is good. We don't have to look elsewhere. This is the last one. This is the one that is most important to me. It's that God is gracious, so we don't have to prove ourselves. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. For most of my life, what motivated my decisions over and over again is I hope at the end of the day, God still loves me. I mean, if you're there with me, hear this, that God is gracious. You don't have to prove yourself. What he is saying is that you don't have to do enough to, to earn his approval, that he just gives it to you because he delights in you, because he has created you, because he loves you. We, we can't have more access to his love. He just gives it to us. Is this good news for you? And here it is. We've got to speak this to ourselves daily. We have to practice the gospel. We have to practice speaking it into our life. We have to rehearse the story. We have to practice the vocabulary. I grew up in a tradition that said we need to preach the gospel to all those other people that don't know it. And what I missed and what I wish I had not have missed is it starts by speaking the gospel into my own life first. So I just wanna run through how this has become practical for me lately, how our family has learned to speak the gospel in and to each other so that we can move from these unbelief areas to belief in Jesus. So just with these cards, I'm gonna walk you through very practically how we do this, how we speak it. Um, I struggle with contentment. That's one of my things. Um, that's probably three weeks ago. Uh, we, we, my wife and I, we went to look at paint colors. When you're married to a designer, you do that for fun sometimes. Um, when I say that we look at paint colors, I mean she looks at paint colors. <laughs> I had been off of social media for like, I don't know, a month or something. And so I'm sitting there um, and I'm thinking, you know what, I got 15 minutes to kill. I'm I'm gonna see what's going on in the world. This is an imaginary phone, by the way. And I'm just kind of flipping through. That's what you do, you just scroll. And I have this like thing growing in me, this angst. (laughs) It's like, I don't feel good. I'm starting to get frustrated. I'm... I don't, you know, like your body sort of does the, oh, I just don't like the way I'm feeling right now. And I started pacing. I started walking around the store trying to find something to distract me. And when we got in the car, 
I, like it clicked in that moment. I just looked at Chris and I said, I have to gospel myself right now because for the past 15 minutes, I've been looking at the social media thing and I've been doing that comparison game that you do where you're looking at the best of everybody else's life that they're posting and going, how come our family hasn't done this? How come I haven't achieved this? How come this in my life? How come... And I just had this dissatisfaction because what was going on is I was thinking if I did this, if we did this, if we got this, then suddenly I'd be satisfied. And my heart was breaking because I'm com communicating to my wife that I'm dissatisfied and she's got to hear this unbelief that's entered. And I said, no, God is good. God is good, and so I don't have to find satisfaction in all these things. We have each other. We have these beautiful kids. Look at what all he has given us. He is so good. And I don't have to give in to that unbelief that I'm going to find it somewhere else in something that will let me down. A year ago, I'd have spent a week in a funk because I wouldn't have known how to look at my life and realize I have missed it. No, God is good. This is good news. Are you with me? And I was able to, like, in a moment just to feel the wholeness of God filling me again as we just sort of worshiped for a bit. I remember the first time I really learned about God's graciousness. I was 28, we had our first child. He was four months old. It's Easter week. It's a long week. It's Thursday. I'm home late, I'm exhausted. This is a really long week. And uh, I'm trying to get cash to go to sleep. And a child is just refusing to fall asleep. And, uh, and we're pacing the floor in his room. I remember we had this rug and like it was dark so I could feel the end of it and I knew I had to turn around and go back the other way and I'm, I'm singing to him trying to get him to fall asleep and I should tell you that like Cash spit up for just a straight year. And when I say that he spit up, I don't just mean like after meals. I mean like he wore a bib like a necktie for a year, just constantly spitting up. And so I'm pacing with him and I'm singing over him and I'm just begging God, please, please, please let him go to sleep. I really... I really want to go to sleep. And, uh, and it, I'm covered in spit up now because it's been long enough. That's happened a few times. And I think other things have leaked out on me. Um, and I just reached this point, you know, there's like all this unsolicited advice you get when you have a child. Um, and there was like one piece that actually was good. And it was, hey, sometimes when they're just crying a whole lot and you can't get them to stop, you should cry with them. And I went, well, I'm going to do that right now. That's where we are. And so, so I sat down in this rocking chair that squeaked, so that's not helping. And uh, I just remember I just began to cry with my son in my arms. And he began to just calm down. And he just had this peaceful moment where he just, it's like he just fell out. And I remember very vividly in that moment, God began to just say to me, this is the way that you come to me. You spit up all over me. You bring your junk and you place it on me. And just like you're feeling right now that there's nothing this child could do that would ever make you stop loving him. There is nothing that he could do that would give him access to more of your love. This is how I love you. And then this phrase came. Brian, please stop trying to prove to me you were worth dying for. You just were. And I had this peace that just filled my heart for the first time in my life. I was, thank you. I don't have to earn it. I'm just loved. And every time I go back to that place where I'm trying to earn the approval of my father and say, I was worth it, I promise you I'm worth it. He says, no, you don't have to earn it. I've just given it to you. Receive this as good news. I'm gracious. You don't have to earn my approval. You can't have access to any more of my love. You got all of it. So when I go back to that place, I just rehearse this story over and over in my life. And sometimes I need my wife to speak it over me. And sometimes I need a good friend to say, there's a place of unbelief in your life. Let me speak gospel news into it. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves daily because it must be worked into us first. And then it gets worked out into community and we have to fully immerse ourselves in gospel community. When you learn a language, immersion is key. We can't just hear it occasionally. 
We can't just hear it for an hour on Sunday. We have to live in it. We have to have people speaking it into our life when we can't do it ourselves. And groups, they're a way of life here at Westside. And for the next four weeks, our, our, our life groups are gonna be going through these four G's of the gospel, just learning how to speak this. Or if you need good news in your life, if you're like, I need some of that in my life, I need to be a part of a group, grab that connect card, just write on there, join a group, drop it in the, in the boxes on the way. I will help you get into a community of people that wanna speak the gospel over you. Maybe you just wanna do this with some family and friends. You're like, I, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to speak this language to my family. Just write group up on there. We'll help you. We'll equip you in doing this. Gospel fluency begins in us. Then it gets worked out into community. And then it goes out to people around us. We have to know it first. It has to be fully integrated into our life. So when our neighbor calls us on Friday night and they're experiencing this very painful place in their life, we're able to say, let me, let me just sit and be with you, but then let me speak some gospel news to you that you are loved. And I know this because I feel it. And because God has again made the relationship right between us and I feel this wholeness now and I'm learning this wholeness between me and my family and my friends and people around me. And I have the sense of identity that I am a child of the creator God. Speak the gospel to yourself daily. So which one of these is kind of hitting for you today? Which one of these four G's is like, you're going, that's the area of unbelief for me. There's a space right there in your notes. Just write it down. Be, begin to practice what that unbelief, like speaking the truth of overcoming that unbelief. Maybe for some of you in the room, like you're hearing gospel news and it's like warming your heart in a new way today. And you're saying, I wanna, I wanna do this. I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna step into a life with him because I need gospel news badly. I'm gonna pray in just a few minutes and help you do that if, that's, if you're ready to take that step. But hear this, scripture clearly says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we surrender our lives to him, that's what that means, if we surrender to his lordship, allowing him to help us overcome our unbelief, step into belief in every area of our life. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved from the penalty of sin from the power of sin in our life and from the presence of sin in the future. It's good news. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you don't leave us. Thank you that, that you didn't make us earn your love. Thank you that, that every area of our life where there's unbelief and we experience this separation, this brokenness between us and you and each other and ourselves, that you wanna bring the fullness of who you are into us and through us. Thank you that you've made a way, that you're at the center of the story through your death and your resurrection that you made a way. So Father, for those in the room that they wanna know you, they wanna know what it's like to have the identity as daughter and as son and as beloved, I, I pray that you help them find words to declare just this, that, that I confess that you're Jesus, that you are Lord. And then I wanna surrender every area of my life to you. I wanna move from unbelief to belief in your resurrection power that God has raised you from the dead. I wanna be saved from the, the penalty and the power and the presence of sin. And I wanna follow you and be like you. And Jesus, for those of us that have stepped into this faith and we're following, I pray that we would pray that prayer every day. I pray that we would just abide in you fully, just continuing to surrender and move from unbelief to belief in you. Help us to speak the gospel language. Let me say we love you, Jesus. Amen. And just a couple of things as you go. We'll have prayer partners down front. If you need to work out one of these things, if you need to just talk with somebody and, and work something out that Jesus is doing in your life, just invite you to come down and talk with one of our prayer partners. If today you made a decision to follow Jesus, you're ready to step into this family and say, I wanna surrender everything, come talk to one of them. They wanna celebrate with you. We wanna pray with you in that. I just say go in this, church. Go in the good news that Jesus has invited us to live in the kingdom, to proclaim the kingdom and to paint pictures of the kingdom in this world. Amen. Go in grace and peace.